This is the Moonlight Graham Show, a freewheeling conversation with the role players, the underdogs, and guys with flat out great stories in sports. Hey guys, it's your old buddy Tim Flattery back here with another episode of the Moonlight Graham Show. And as we've been talking about earlier this week, sports are back. Sports are so back to the point that we have a golf major this week. The PGA Championship tees off today out in Northern California, and there is an underdog in the field. There is a Moonlighter in the mix. How big of an underdog, you might ask? 1,000 to 1 underdog. If you put Put one dollar on our Moonlighter to win the PGA Championship today. You will win a thousand dollars. So our Moonlighter for today is a guy from the greatest town in America, Fort Dodge, Iowa. He played at Iowa State University from 1987 to 1992. He played on a bunch of mini tours from 92 to 98. He's the five-time PGA Iowa Section Player of the Year, the two-time PGA Coach of the Year in the state of Iowa. He's played in a couple of PGA events before in the John Deere Classic over in the Quad Cities, but this is his first time ever appearing in a golf major he is 51 year old judd gibb that's right at 51 years old judd gibb is playing in his very first golf major this week out in northern california and i actually had the chance to talk with him earlier this week on monday while he was in his hotel room he had just wrapped up a practice round got off the practice green and joined the moonlight graham show and i'm so excited to bring this episode out as sports are coming back and And we have a great Moonlighter story, a great underdog story to tell with the first golf major back during this pandemic. And Judd's story is so cool because it's so reminiscent of the movie Tin Cup with Kevin Cosner, when Kevin Cosner, of course, was this great college golfer, this great golfer who is now giving lessons, and he ends up qualifying for the U.S. Open in that movie, and he makes a run in the U.S. Open. Judd Gibb, of course, has had a highly decorated golf career, but he's never really broken through to the point where he's made the PGA Tour. And he tells some great stories in this episode about his how close he became And so it's great that he finally broke through to the point where he's playing in a golf major and it would be so much fun if he played really well, he makes the cut and we see his name on the leaderboard at some point this weekend. And the best part about it is he's from Fort Dodge, my hometown. He lives in Fort Dodge right now. He's a great asset to the Fort Dodge golf community. I should also mention his son, Andrew Gibb, is the all-time leading scorer at Fort Dodge St. Edmund High School in basketball. So Andrew Gibb is a college basketball player right now, but is a heck of a basketball player in his own right. And Andrew was supposed to caddy for Judd in this tournament, but because of the pandemic, Judd had to pick up a different caddy, which we'll talk about here in the episode. I think you guys are really going to enjoy Judd's perspective and his love and enthusiasm for the game of golf. And it will give everybody out there an underdog to root for during this PGA Championship. And as always, folks, if you like what we're doing here on the Moonlight Graham Show, subscribe wherever it is that you get your podcast. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher. Subscribe to the Moonlight Graham Show. And you know the drill. Leave us a five-star review. You can also follow the show on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. We love hearing from you guys each and every week. So enjoy today's episode with Moonlighter, Judd Gibb. First off, man, congratulations on, on getting in the PGA. I know it's been coming up for a while now, but I bet there was uh, some nervousness for you whether this was going to happen or not. Well, yeah, absolutely. Well, number one, you know, getting through this whole COVID test and all that, I mean, you just, as you know, you never know. You know, so many people feel great, and then all of a sudden they get tested and 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 they have it. But on top of that, I had kind of some reservations whether they would even have the tournament or not. I mean, being out here in Northern California, and I know just from watching the news out here, they have all sorts of cases out here, but here we are, they're having it. As far as I know, uh, I haven't had anybody tell me different. So (laughs) trying to get ready. What is the COVID protocols in Northern California right now for this tournament? Well, I, I think the PGA of America, it sounds like they kind of adopted what the PGA Tour does. So 
you're not allowed on site unless you have a negative test. So let's see, I got here Saturday night, Sunday morning, they started testing at 7 a.m. and I got there about 8, 8.30, did the test and uh, they said it could take up to four hours. So I came back to the hotel and waited and waited and waited. Seemed like a long time, but it was probably about two and a half hours and I got the all clear. And then, then at that point I was allowed to check in go up to the golf course and, uh, you know, do what you'd normally do. I started practicing and waiting. I had to wait for my caddy to get through. He came through a little later and it took almost four hours for him to get his test back. And then, you know, every morning when you come in, they temperature check you, ask you a bunch of questions uh, before they let you through. So you can't be too safe, obviously. I mean, you know, the PGA Tour and the PGA of America, they're, they're doing their best to, you know, make sure that nobody that's on site has the virus or is testing positive. I don't know if it's like the NBA, but it's pretty close. I mean, you have to wear a mask at all times unless you're like on in the practice areas or you're actually on the golf course playing. And then you and your caddy don't have to wear a mask. But in the locker rooms, walking to the practice screen, walking to the uh, practice areas, you have to have a mask on. And it's my understanding that that's kind of the way the whole state of California is. I mean, you see people jogging and they're wearing masks. So wow. it's a little different than in Fort Dodge where, you know, it's kind of 50, 50, maybe on a good day where if people are wearing masks, but uh, it, it's what you have to do. Um, so you just, you go by the rules. How much was the virus weighing on your mind as you're you're practicing over the last month getting ready for this thinking, you know, is my is my one shot at a major major championship going to get derailed because of some idiot on the golf course that has the virus and gives it to me? Well, number 1, it weighed on me huge. In fact, for the uh, 14 days prior to coming, I gave up teaching and uh, you know, Chad Graff at Lakeside, he was like, yeah, don't even come around here. And, and, and it's not because I thought, you know, gosh, my students are going to have it and give it to me or something like that. I just thought I'm going to, you know, mitigate that one thing that, you know, I'm close to them. And when you teach the game of golf and well, any sport, you have to get close to people and sometimes put your hands on them. And the crazy thing about this is how many people have it and don't know they have it. They feel fine. And, and, uh, you know, if you don't feel like you're sick, you're not going to get tested. So, so for the two weeks before, I I, re- I didn't do any any teaching. You know, I have a son at home waiting to go to school, and my daughter is 14, and they're in and out of the house. So my wife uh, put me in the basement for the last two weeks. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm I'm hoping it's not permanent, but she certainly uh, said she was getting better night's sleep. So when I get back, I hope I still have a spot in our bedroom. But And I can't say that I'm perfect as far as wearing a mask and things like that. And certainly prior to knowing I was coming to the PGA, if I was going to Casey's, I'd just run in there real quick and think, yeah, no big deal. But certainly for the, you know, the, the, the 14 days or so before I came, I mean, I had a mask on every place I went and, uh, you know, you just cross your fingers and hope that you don't get it somehow. How excited are you to be playing in your, you know, your first ever major? You know, this has been a long time coming for you. So just strictly golf speaking, how's your, how's your mentality right now? Well, yeah, extremely excited, but I'll be honest with you, um, you know, the, the way that they set up these golf courses now, being that I'm 51 years old, it's not exactly in my wheelhouse as far as, you know, the setup. It, it, it's long. And, you know, the funny thing is, is my caddy, the caddy's on the PGA Tour. We're on the first tee up yesterday afternoon. He said, well, you know, length isn't a big thing on this course. Well, length isn't a big thing for the guys that play for a living. Uh, the, there's a lot of par fours that are 470, 480. There's one that's uh, 515, and uh, it's a little long for me. But uh, it's a wonderful golf course. You would expect it would be extremely difficult. I mean, they're trying to identify who the best player in the world is. It's a major championship. 
So, you know, for my game, no, it doesn't set up great at this point, but I, I'm having a ball. I mean, it, it's, uh, I talked to my son this afternoon and I said, you know, it's really weird. You know, there's not any, there's nobody out here, but you look up on the putting green and Tiger's like 10 feet from you and there's Brooks Kepka and Roy McIlroy. And it's kind of like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. How did you get your caddy? I really wanted Andrew to caddy for me. Yeah, and, your son, uh, Andrew. Yeah, he was going to caddy in the senior PGA for me, and that was in late May, and, of course, they canceled that. And then he was going to caddy in the John Deere for me, and, of course, they canceled that. And when this whole PGA thing came up, it was just getting close enough time to where he'd be leaving for school. And I got to thinking, gosh, if, if he, you know, was to get the virus and he had to sit in a hotel for 14 days and not touch a basketball – so I just told him, listen, it's way more important to me that you caddy than it is to you. And that's fine. So they have, you know, they, there's a guy that's in charge of caddies. And I called him and said, hey, I'm looking. And I couldn't have gotten luckier. The, this guy that I have, his name is Danny Pepsi. He, he's caddied on the PGA Tour and, and Corn Ferry Tour for probably the last six or seven years. He caddies for a young guy now. His name is Brandon Wu that... Uh, is just out of Stanford and is a really good player. But Danny's actually from San Francisco and he just had the week off and he and he'd heard that they were, you know, might be looking for some caddies and and uh and he's a great guy and he will help me. Now I'm not sure he'll help me enough. And I don't think anybody can. But no, he'll he'll help me. And uh it, it's always neat to have and I've been lucky enough to have some professional caddies like that and you know, anybody that thinks they just carry the bag and, and, and don't help is seriously wrong. I mean, they're, I, mean, I, I just can't imagine how much they help guys that, uh, you know, are, are, are the great players. It's, a, it's amazing some of the insights he has, and, and uh, he'll be a huge help. So, Judd, you, you've kind of been ragging on your game a little bit though, this far, but what is, the, what is the goal for you this week? Is the goal to, to make the cut, or is the goal to, you know, ultimately to win it, or what's in your mind as the goal here? Well, uh, you know, great question. I don't have any, you know, illusions of grandeur as far as, you know, um, you know being in, in the mix. It's a funny time in my life being, you know, a little bit older, I hit the ball pretty straight. The problem is the club head speed isn't isn't really high. So yeah, I mean if you know, I think about okay, if I was playing the John Deere and I played really good, I could make the cut. Here, I would have to play extremely well to make the cut. And that's you know, that's I don't want to say that's a knock on my game or I'm thinking negative at all. It, the golf course is long enough that you know, if if I'm hitting, you know, uh, uh, hybrid or three irons or four irons in the greens and and the rest of the field, the guys that are in their 20s are hitting seven and eight irons, I mean, that's a huge, huge advantage they have. And, and, and they should have that. So, you know, it's going to be a different kind of a mindset tournament-wise and where I have to go into it. And, 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 and number one, it's a par 70. There's two par fives that they've turned into par fours. But in reality, it's still a par 72 for me. It's not a par 70. But crazy things happen. You get a hot putter and make some par putts and maybe roll a birdie around. I could have a couple of good rounds. But I'm not sure, and this is going to sound crazy, because I'm a, as a competitive a person as you'll ever meet, um, I, I'm not going to worry about my score. You know, at this point, this is my last chance to play in a major. I'm going to enjoy it. And regardless of what I shoot, I'm just going to have fun. Is the toughest part of this course, you've mentioned the length, is that the toughest part of this course for you? Or is it, you know, I know how they really do up these courses with the thick rough and the fast greens and the tough pin placements, especially for majors. Is that going to be more daunting or is is it going to be the length for you? Well, I think, you know, the the length is a huge factor. But one of the things on this golf course, there are quite a few dog leg to the left, you know, so the guys that draw the ball probably have an advantage. And I've always been a fader. I hit the ball straight. You know, I, I do drive the ball really, really straight, but on those holes, it's a little bit tough. I have to kind of go over some trees, which, you know, the last thing you really want to do is to try to drive it over a tree that's about 
80 yards in front of the tee box for fear that you might hit it. You know, the rough is penalizing. There's no doubt. The one thing, and, and it's early in the week and things might change, the fairways are slow, which certainly doesn't play into my game. I mean, I'd like to get some run out. Um, I'm not really worried about, you know, the ball running through the fairway. That's not a concern of mine. But I've noticed that the ball isn't chasing so, you know, when you hit it in the fairway, it's only releasing maybe 15, 20 yards. And the greens are, yeah, they're very firm. So it's a tough setup. There's no doubt. But, you know, if you hit good shots, you'll be rewarded. But, um, you know, if you hit bad shots, if you get in that rough, that most of the time, you know, that rough, you know, because of the way that they, you know, the water, the fairway. So the first fairways and rough you know the first probably 12 yards of the rough is brutal i mean unless something crazy happened you the furthest i could move it was a maybe 120 yards if you get off of there a little bit further you might come up with a decent lie to where you could hit it further but there's huge trees so you know the rough is terrible you know it's tough but you know you should name it the rough anyway so you've been around the game for a long time. Obviously, you you played at Iowa State. You've won a bunch of tournaments in your career. You're in the Iowa Golf Hall of Fame. But you just mentioned seeing Tiger Woods or Brooks Kepka, you know, the the kind of next generation of golfers out of this golf course. Is there a guy that even you after your long career that you're going to see this week and kind of fanboy out on? Well, you know, you try to act cool and act like, you know, that's not that big of a deal, but yeah, to see Tiger and I've seen him before, but I'm on the outside of the ropes yeah. so to be on the inside. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, all those guys, you know, I found myself on the putting green today, late this afternoon, I was, you know, trying to find a putting stroke and, you know, I caught myself being a fan. I'm, I'm watching all these drills these guys are doing. I'm, I'm making mental notes, not maybe so much for myself, but my students at home. Of, well, you know, the best player in the world is doing this drill, and maybe, you know, you should do it. But, <laughs> you know, I, I literally did look up today, and, and you know, Tiger's 10 feet from me. So I tried to keep my cool, and I kind of started putting the other way. And Brooks Kepka's on that hole. And next thing I know, Dustin Johnson's right behind me. So, yeah, it, it's kind of cool, you know, to, to see those guys and, and be on that side of the ropes. It, it, it's interesting. I mean, you know, there's no there's no fans out there. They're all nice guys. I mean, if you walk by them, they're like, hey, you know, how are you doing? You know, good morning or good afternoon. I mean, so it's, it, that part's strange. And that's, you know, I was thinking about this the other night. You know, golf is such a great game. You know, for somebody like me, to be in an event like this, I mean, it's not like if you're a you know former basketball player, you're going to get to go and warm up on the court with LeBron James and maybe get a couple minutes in or go on the field in an NFL game and, 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 and get to see Tom Brady. And, you know, golf is a funny game in that those opportunities sometimes do arise. Yeah, you're, you're right about that. And as I was thinking about you playing in the tournament this week, it reminds me of like Tin Cup and Roy McAvoy. And one of my favorite things about that movie is when he shows up, he's got a bunch of funny sponsors, you know, kind of like low level sponsors all over his clothing that stand out from, you know, your standard big time golf sponsorships. Are you going to be having any sponsors on your clothing that you're wearing? I wish somebody would have wanted to sponsor me. No. <laughs> The, I, I should just put uh, a Judd and Mary Gibb on the front of my golf shirt. Uh, it's funny you bring that movie up because on the practice range was it last night, Tiger was hitting balls about 10 feet from, or well, probably 10 yards. And I thought about that scene where he started shanking them and they were looking, you know, uh, he and uh, his caddy were looking to see who did it and all that. But I didn't shank any, but uh, the only thing that, so I didn't shank any, but of course in the Tin Cup movie, he actually contended. So um, I don't know if I'll have that part of it, or uh, maybe I'll make a birdie early and I'll have my name on the leaderboard. But uh, yes, no sponsors other than Taylor Made Golf and uh, the Judd and Mary Gibb Foundation. <laughs> Do you know who you're paired up with yet? Well, they'll release the pairings at some point tomorrow. So okay. I don't know. They used to 
in the past, they kind of pair the club pros with the club pros. I don't know if they still do that. I know when Sean McCarty played two years ago, um, he got paired with, you know, a couple tour players. My friend Jeff Schmid from Iowa City, when he played last year, he played with some tour players. So, you know, that's a possibility. And that would be fun, you know, to get an up-close look at how those guys, you know, uh, get their business done. Judd, what's the most nervous you've ever been on a golf course? Well, it was I, – I, I can tell you exactly when it was. It was uh, 1996 uh, PGA Tour qualifying, and it was in the second stage. And in the PGA Tour qualifying at that time, they had a first stage, a second stage, and then if you got through the second stage to the finals, you, worst-case scenario, got what would be now a Corn Ferry Tour card. And – I had played very well. It was down in uh, Gulf Shores, Alabama. It was, you know, I had worked really hard. My game was sharp. And I hadn't been nervous the whole week. And I got on the first tee in the last round and literally was worried about how I was going to get the golf ball on the tee. And I don't have any idea why it hit me then. But I, I really, I truly did. I had to put my feet together around the tee to put the ball on and try to make sure my playing partners didn't notice you know how nervous I was and unfortunately the nerves got to me and I didn't play very well that last round but I I remember that vividly and I share that with my students I mean and you know you being an athlete you know that if you're not nervous you're not ready and that there's nothing wrong with that but that was the time where uh you know I, I the nerves really got to me there's no doubt about it will there be any nerves similar to that when you tee it up on Thursday I'm sure there will, but if there was 10,000 people around the first tee, which would be, you know, kind of traditional for the PGA, it would be completely different. Um, it'll be a little bit maybe more like our National Club Pro Championship, where certainly you have nerves. Um, I've had the opportunity a couple times to be on TV while playing, and, you know, you kind of get a little, I don't know about nervous at that point, but it's a little different when you have a tv camera right by you they're not going to have a tv camera by me a club pro but i'll definitely feel nerves on the first tee i get nervous in pro-ams and and uh at least i try to um i like that feeling because you know you're ready to go and uh it's a fun feeling if you know you get on the first tee and you don't have any nerves then either it doesn't mean a lot to you or you're just not ready to play so you've brought up teaching a couple of times, and I know you've, you've been like the two-time PGA Iowa Teacher of the Year, and you and I have never played golf together, and so you've never sw- seen me swing. But what am I doing wrong, Judd? Well, I know you're a baseball player. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And every baseball player always tells me the same thing. Well, I have a baseball swing. And I'll tell you what, there aren't a lot of differences between golf and baseball a- at all. Other than the fact is growing up as a baseball player, a lot of coaches, they want you thinking about baseball and not golf. So they say, well, it's bad for your game. But you get to the major leagues and those guys all play. Um, You know, the one thing I see certainly with a right-handed baseball player is you grow up and you're taught to hit it down the right field line. And that's not great for golf. That's going to be a slice every time. So I have a lot of guys that play baseball or did play baseball. And we talk about that. Uh, you know, the, it's a stick and it's a ball. It's a low outside pitch, but this low outside pitch, we don't want to hit down the first baseline. We've got to hit it over the pitcher. And I've always found when I talk about that, a lot of times the left-handed baseball players have a little more luck than the right-handed because it's tough to break those old habits. But you know, the, the, the games are very similar. It's a stick and a ball. And if you're a good hitter, it's hand-eye coordination. But once you learn how to use that golf club as you would have with a bat, it makes the game a lot easier. I like that. So there is hope for me. There is hope. <laughs> there is hope. But you'd have to give this whole thing up and start practicing. Yeah, I know. I mean, well, one of my things is what I want to do is go out to a par three course and just play two balls off of every off of every tee box on a par three course all day long and see how close I can get to a hole in one. I think that would kind of be fun to do, but Sunkiss Meadows and Fort Dodge doesn't exist anymore. I know it, 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 the one thing that completely disappoints me about when we moved back to Fort Dodge is that Sunkiss is no longer open. 
And I know they had to close it because of budget reasons and probably things that I'll never know. But think of how many people in Fort Dodge, in a great golf town too, learned to play golf at Sunkiss, whether their grandparents took them or their parents took them. <clears throat> it, was a, it was a wonderful place to learn the game of golf. And a par three course is a great place to play because, gosh, you know, even if you're not that good, you're probably going to have a birdie putt or two right. playing nine holes, where if you go to a normal golf course, you know, they're going to be bogey putts. So I love par three courses. And, and, and when we lived in Des Moines, there was one that we used to go to. And I know Jester Park has one. So sometimes it'd be a little bit on the busy side. But down in Norwalk, Iowa, just south of town, they had a par three course. And uh, uh, my son and I used to go there all the time. And they had holes that were like 70 to 160 yards. And I, gosh, I found that it helped my game probably, you know, uh, more than it helps my son's game, uh, just because you got used to, you know, hitting all those clubs that are important. You hit a lot of wedges when you're out there. You weren't really worried about how far you were going to hit it. Gosh, maybe someday they'll bring back some kids. I, we'll, we'll, and you and I will be the first guys to play. I like that idea, Judd. How many hole-in-ones do you have? Well, <clears throat> a lot of times people don't believe me when I say this, but I've had seven hole-in-ones. I've been pretty lucky on that. Wow. Uh, on that case. In fact, I, I did, I have made a hole in one on all the par threes at the Fort Dodge country club at one point in my life. And then I've had, you know, a couple others, but hole in ones, there is maybe some talent to it, but a lot of it's luck. I mean, um, you know, how many times you open up the newspaper and you see some guy that you know, that, you know, he can't break 50 on his best day as a hole in one. You know, I mean, a lot of it is luck and some great players really haven't had that many. So I've been lucky that way. I'm guessing it's because I play a lot of golf. Judd, the way we end every episode of the Moonlight Graham show is with the five big questions. The first question is, who is your dream foursome? If you could put together a foursome of any three other guys in the world, who would it be? Well, mine's probably not all that exciting. I'd go with you know, two guys that, that aren't around anymore, my dad and my, my uncle Ed, and then I'd have my son, Andrew Gibbs. So that would be, that would be mine. Um, not as exciting as Ben Hogan and those guys, but that's who my guys would be. How much are you winning out of those foursomes? How much are you winning by? Well, uh, my uncle and my dad on their best day, if they cheated, they couldn't have ever come close to beating me. <laughs> and that is the one sport, although my son is pretty good, He's not beating me in golf, so there's no chance. I will win that every day of the week. I like that. What's one moment that you have from your career, Judd, that reminds you of ever, everything that you love about the game of golf? Well, I, you know, I'm not sure there's one moment. I mean, I, I've been pretty lucky in my life. You know, every day that I go to work, I get to go to the golf course. So, uh, you know, uh, every day is a good day. I, I, I just enjoy the game. I love people that like golf. I like to talk golf. I, I just I just can't get enough of it. And, you know, even in the dead of wintertime, I, I'm the guy that has the golf channel on or is calling friends in Florida to see how they're playing. Um, I wish there was one moment that stood out, but I, I, I'm, I'm completely honest. Every day that I go to Lakeside to teach, I, I just love it. I, I just can't wait to get out there in the morning. And, and you know, a lot of times when I'm leaving, I, I just can't wait to get back the next day. Well, that's good. I mean, that, that means you picked the right profession then, right? Well, you know, my accountant might disagree with that, <laughs> but, you know, the, the, I guess, you know, the, you know, happiness is a, is a big thing in life. And I know there's, you know, guys that, you know, are a lot more successful uh, on, on the financial end, but I'll, I'll tell you what, um, you know, my office is pretty good every morning when I, when I look out and, you know, you see a golf course, no matter where I'm at. I mean, it's a great, it's a great thing. So you mentioned the nerves back in 1996, but is there one shot or one round that still bothers you more than any from your career? Oh gosh. I, I think I could write a book about the bad shots that I've hit. You being an athlete, you know this. You try to wipe those things out of your mind as, as as quickly as you can. But you know, you learn more from your your failures than you ever do your your successes. Um, you know, 
there was one time in our national club pro where, you know, I was playing about as good as I could. And, you know, coming down the stretch, I was right in the hunt and I bogeyed the 17th hole, which kind of put me out of contention for any sort of title hopes. But as luck would have it, trying to qualify for the PGA was still there and it was a par five and I played the hole absolutely perfectly. And, 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 you know, it was a three shot hole for me. I hit a wedge to about 15 feet and I'll go to my deathbed. I hit a good first putt and it was you know, kind of uphill up over a tier and I left it about three feet short and I got up there, hit the putt the way I thought and I didn't even hit the hole. And I'll be honest with you, I had nightmares about that. I mean, you know, you, you bogey the last hole to miss the PGA Championship. Well, I bogeyed the last two holes. And, of course, I made the wise decision that I was going to drive to Syracuse, New York that year. And so I had a 14-hour drive home, which I did straight through the first 13 hours, about as mad as anybody could ever be. But, yeah, that was a, that was a tough one to swallow. But, you know – we're golfers. We hit bad shots. I'm going to hit bad shots on Thursday and Friday for sure. It's, it's kind of how I just hope my bad charts aren't that bad. What's your all time favorite course to play? And this will sound kind of weird, but you know, golf, golf courses and the way people like it, it's kind of like art. You know, you say one course and another person is all, Oh, that's, that's horrible. You know, I love I, this part of the country is amazing. I, 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 you know, I love Pebble Beach. I've got the chance to play there a couple times, but I try to just, when I go to a new golf course, it's always my favorite course. You know, when we lived in Des Moines, people would always ask me, what's your favorite course to play? And I was lucky enough to work at Des Moines Golf, and I, I love that course. But then when I'd go play Wakanda Club, gosh, that's my favorite course. And if I had a chance to play Glen Oaks, well, gosh, you know, that's my favorite. So I've been pretty lucky. Um, I've played so many great ones. Um, Colonial Country Club in, 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 in Texas is, of course, they play a PGA Tour event on, and, you know, and I think they play the U.S. Open there, too. I mean, that's a fun course. I, I just um, – it's hard to pinpoint one, but I'll tell you this. I grew up playing – I got a job at the Fort Dodge Country Club when I was 12 years old. And as you know, they're not going to host a, a huge big-time tournament there. I play there a lot. We live there. That's probably my favorite course because it just means so much to me being from Fort Dodge and that's where I grew up. And uh, that's certainly not a lot knock against the course I work at Lakeside, but Fort Dodge, if I had to play one, one round, if that's all I had left, I would go back and play the Fort Dodge Country Club. Man, I just played the Fort Dodge Country Club a couple of weeks ago with my dad and brothers. And I was just blown away by how good of shape that course was in. It's the best greens that I've played all year. And, and Lakeside's in great shape, too. I think people are really surprised when they, they come to Fort Dodge and realize, you know, those two golf courses are really, really nice. Well, they're great golf courses. And living there, and, and as you know, the fees that you play to belong to the country club, oh, yeah. the fees you pay to Lakeside, if you move those courses to Kansas City, it's a whole different ball ball game. So, you know, the, the people of our, you know, our community are so lucky to have those golf courses and, and uh, you know, both superintendents at Lakeside and Chad Graff, and he, you know, he takes care of Harlan Rogers too. And then Mark Seams at the country club, they do more, they do more with less than any superintendents I've seen. And uh, you know, I love both courses and you're so right. They're, they're in great shape and, and, uh, I, you know, I'd hate to tell people what it costs to play both places because it's, 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 it's a sin. <laughs> right. So final question here, Judd, what's the best advice you've ever received? Oh, well, gosh, I, I've been pretty lucky and had, you know, advice from, you know, so many in, in certainly in the golf business, so many great people. Um, I'm getting ready for this Iowa golf hall of fame thing and, and going through, you know, some of the people that helped me and, I've been so lucky in life. It's just amazing when it comes to golf. I've just been in the right place at the right time and had guys uh, that have given me guidance in, in, in this game, whether it's Ken Shaw, who's you know a fantastic player and teacher down in Des Moines, or J.D. Turner, who kind of took me under his wing as a teacher and hired me to do corporate golf outings. And I got to be around – you know, uh, John Vermal, Larry Gladson, who started, ja uh, uh, excuse me, Zach Johnson in golf, um, just kind of the who's who. So 
it's really hard for me to say, you know, I got some great advice from one person. I get great advice all the time. And I would be, I would be crazy not to say, and this, and she'll never believe I said this, but my wife gives me the best advice and she usually talks me off of the, uh, off of the ledge. And, uh, I'm sure she probably will probably Thursday morning before my tea time telling me it's okay, breathe, relax. You'll be just fine out there. So if I, if, if I had to make it uh, a decision, anything my wife says is usually the best advice I get. Spoken like a married man right there. Well, that's right. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Judd, thank you so much uh, for finding some time in your week here. Good luck with the, the preparation as you go into you know Thursday. I know this is going to be a dream come true for you. And this is a lot of fun for not only Iowans, but, but those that are in Fort Dodge and grew up in Fort Dodge. We'll all, all be cheering for you. And everybody here on the Moonlight Graham Show will be rooting for you as well. I'll need all the help I can get. And, and uh, I probably wouldn't start at the top of the leaderboard. You might start at the bottom and work out. But I'll, I'll give it my best go. All right. Well, thank you so much and, and good luck, Judd. Hey, guys. Thanks once again to listening to today's episode of the Moonlight Graham Show. And even though I do most of the interviews here on the podcast, there is a ton of work that happens behind the scenes that you guys don't see that make each episode possible. So I got to give a shout out to the Moonlight Graham Show team. First of all, Brian Sandvig, our producer. Brian does all of the post-production work. And in real life, he's not just a podcast producer. He's also a real estate agent. So if you're looking to buy or sell a home down in the Kansas or Missouri areas, give Brian Sandvig a call. Next guy on that list is Brendan Gargano. Brendan does all of our design and artwork here on the podcast. He's one of the most talented artists I've ever met, and I love all of his work. If you need any help on the design side with logos or anything like that, give Brendan Gargano a call. The next guy on that list is Andy Flattery, my older brother. Andy, of course, has done some of the of the interviews here on the podcast. He also is a certified financial planner. He owns a business called Simple Wealth Planning. If you need any help in that area, check Andy Flattery out. And then, of course, the trusty co-host, Tom Griffin, and my younger brother, Neil Flattery. Those guys are just busy being husbands, being fathers. They're family men, but also they do a ton of work here on the show. So thanks again for listening. We really appreciate you guys subscribing and supporting the Moonlight Graham Show.